Christ is in our midst. Christos posredi nas. Christos este kunoi. Today we celebrate the glorious feast of the Transfiguration. Yes, a feast on which traditionally the harvest was already being brought in, and so the first fruits of the harvest were blessed. But of course, this is what is happening in terms of the cycle of the seasons and the church sanctifies time and blesses the cycle of the seasons, but it is not the main focus of the feast by any means. The main focus of the feast is on this beautiful event with the Lord and the holy prophets Moses and Elias and the three apostles. And that's not all. And together with the Father and the Holy Spirit who are in this gospel as well, perhaps in a way which is not as evident to everyone at first, but the cloud that of glory that is coming over the apostles embodies the Holy Spirit and the voice is the voice of the Father clearly because he says, this is my beloved Son. And so the Son is glorified, the Father speaks, and the Holy Spirit envelops the everyone, including the apostles, in this great cloud of glory, the Trinity revealed here again, just like in a similar fashion to the revelation of the Trinity on the day of the baptism of the Lord. And at the end of his life, we hear in the epistle, St. Peter is still experiencing the transfiguration. We ought to understand his words that he's not just recalling it, when he says, when we were with the Lord on the holy mountain and we became and we became participants, we viewed his majesty, we saw his great majesty, his glory. He is himself still changed by that experience and he's articulating it before his death to remind the Christians that you should understand Christ through this event. We didn't believe in fables. Here's what we experienced. And this is a key, a key which is lost by many Christians, that if St. Peter continued to understand the plan of salvation and understand the Lord through this experience, we ought to as well. We ought to understand everything in Scripture through this experience. It's not that this represents everything in Scripture, but that everything in Scripture must be understood through the Transfiguration. You may find that a rather bold statement. And perhaps you haven't heard it very often. But let's look at this more carefully. The timing of this event right before the crucifixion and the resurrection. It is so that the apostles will interpret, will understand the crucifixion through the transfiguration, that they will understand that the one who is crucified is the Lord of glory. How do we know that such an interpretation has remained in the church? We know because the fathers of the church interpret the crucifixion in this way. And, of course, if you look even at an icon of the crucifixion, as you can see here, you can see that the Lord is called the King of Glory. Why call him the King of Glory when he's on the cross? Well, the obvious answer is because he's victor on the cross. Jesus Christos Nika. He's victorious. True. The Romans, most of them didn't understand, with a brilliant exception that you can see in the icon, that he is the King of glory, the Lord of glory. But the apostles would know this. 
And certainly St. Peter, St. James, and St. John. St. John at the cross is grief-stricken, but he understands that the one who is being crucified is the Lord of glory, the King of glory. He understands the cross through the transfiguration, which he has just experienced a short while before. And to bring this back to us, this is how we should always understand the Lord. We should always understand the Lord as the Lord of glory. Whenever we read him in scripture, he performs a miracle. We need to understand this is the King of glory. This is the Lord of glory who does this. Even when he is born in the manger in very humble circumstances, we need to understand that he is the King of glory. And that's how we understand all of scripture. And this changes things for us. Because over 20 centuries, some Christians, not meaning to do so, separated the transfiguration from the other events in the life of the Lord. They began to read the events as separate events, disconnected from the transfiguration. They began to read the crucifixion of the Lord with less and less light. I'm not saying no light, but less and less light of the Holy Transfiguration in their reading. And so you get an understanding of the Lord crucified that is not illumined by his transfiguration. It produces a somewhat different result. I'm not saying a critically different result, but an important, there's an important difference here, an important difference. We begin to see the Lord, and you see this in, as art develops outside of iconography, that the Lord is sometimes not shown as the Lord of glory anymore. The inscription is lost. He is shown in great suffering and in absolute stark contrast to the tradition of the church and the witness of Holy Scripture, even in some paintings, and they are paintings, he is shown decaying, his body decaying on the cross, subject to corruption, thinking that such a portrayal would be emotionally striking to the viewers and make the point of his suffering. It does make the point, and it also completely opposes everything that we are told in Scripture. The Lord's body did not suffer corruption ever, on the cross included. He was glorified on the cross as the King of glory, as the church has received. The problem was not with his glorification, the problem was with the perception. So a Roman centurion can see him as the Lord of glory, St. John can see him as the Lord of glory, the Theotokos can see him as the Lord of glory, and the others, many of the others, cannot. Don't understand him that way. And here is the explanation as to why so few people were on Mount Tabor. Those whom the Lord chose, who on behalf of the other apostles, experienced him as the Lord of glory. They were ready to see him that way. Had you invited a crowd on Mount Tabor, it's a purely hypothetical question, but not everyone would have seen the Lord glorified. Not everyone would have seen the holy prophets, Moses and Elias. They would have seen the Lord as an ordinary man, and so that's why they weren't there. So what does that mean for us? When you hear St. Peter making the appeal, he's making the appeal because he understands that Christians over time forget that the Lord is the King of glory, forget that everything in Scripture must be read through this glorious moment. And for those of you who read theology, I'll give you a key to understanding Orthodox theology, that in Orthodox, Orthodox theology is essentially the presentation of the Lord glorified. 
Christ in glory, the articulation of Christ in glory, that's theology. Not philosophical speculation about the existence of God, that's not theology. Theology is the articulation in the apostolic tradition of the Lord in glory. And this is what we need to understand. It affects all the theology. How does it affect us? Well, you see, you and I are subject to exactly the same tendency. There is no point here or no reason to point one's finger at others, at other Christians or those outside of the church. We do it. We do it ourselves. We have the icons, we have the tradition, and we forget that the Lord is the Lord of glory. We fail to understand that he is glorifying us. And so we take the transfiguration and we make it an isolated event. We're happy about it. It's a joyful feast. For us it shows that the Lord is the Lord of glory and he is truly divine. We accept all of that. But we don't understand that we have to live in such a way that shows that we believe that the Lord is the Lord of glory. That the Lord of Scripture is the King of glory, and that every time we open the New Testament and the Old, we see the Lord of glory, we meet the Lord of glory, and we ourselves live that way. You see, a priest in the church can tell people, avoid sin because it's wrong. Perhaps some priests find it tempting to make people feel guilty, I don't tend to take that approach, but I'll tell you an extremely convincing one. Avoid sin because you're being glorified with the Lord. I didn't say anything about guilt. It's basically you and I asking ourselves, who are you? Who are you? I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Well, it means I have faith in the Lord. I've repented of my sins. Yes, it also means you were baptized. You and I were baptized. Into whom were we baptized? Christ. What does that mean? You may be saying, oh, come on, stop. This Christ. This one. The Lord of glory. Not another one. We are baptized into the Lord of glory, the King of glory. What does that mean? You and I were glorified. You and I were glorified. We're glorified already. It means you and I are being glorified if we're cooperating because the Lord is gentle. He doesn't push his glory, force his glory upon people. He doesn't make people feel guilty about not receiving his glory. He offers it. Glorification is the biggest argument for living the Christian life, for knowing who we are in a society in which everybody is forgetting who they are. No clue of who a human being is anymore. It's all being lost before our very eyes. In this genera generation, it's being lost. Who's supposed to tell them about it if it isn't the church? They can't understand all the theology of deification and, and glorification and transfiguration yet until they are within the church. So in simple language and in simple deeds, you and I need to embody and show forth the transfiguration to the world. Live that way. Be convinced of the truth of Scripture and hear what St. Peter is saying. We and you did not believe in fables because we were witnesses to his most excellent majesty when we were with the Lord on the mountain. There is his appeal. As he dies, he's saying, before I die, I'm going to remind you of this critical experience that we were there, and in other words, that you entered into it when we baptized you, 
and that you ought never to forget the truth of this experience if you remain in it. You can see what a compelling appeal this is, but you can also see how easily it's lost in the church. It just takes a couple of simple steps and the transfiguration gets repackaged as a beautiful event 2,000 years ago. And sorry to say, that's exactly where it stays. Unless you and I do something about it. Celebrate the feast, not just so that we can get our food blessed, but that through the year, through the sufferings, through the temptations, through all of the difficult experiences uh, that we live through on a daily basis, through the disappointment, through depression, through hurt, through despair even, you and I would be able to say, in spite of it all, as I believe the Lord, as I cooperate with Him, together with Him, I am being glorified. We know that He was glorified on the Holy Mountain, and we stand there together.